Good, so I, I want to show you t today how to actually use a quantum computer once we give you one to solve a real electronic nuclear structure problem or a quantum chemistry problem or a Hubbard model or a Cupre superconductor on a quantum computer. The basic idea is due to Feynman, so the, those are like references to, to read. If you want to learn about how a quantum computer works and the gate sets and the Deutsch algorithm and teleports and so on, and there's this great textbook, the standard book, and in that you should read the first 200 pages that basically covers what I did yesterday in a bit more detail. The basic idea is to define man, he said, okay, on a quantum the computer you can do physics. Seth Lloyd then had the paper uh, a decade later saying that you can do a quantum simulation of like, lattice models or, or on the quantum hardware, where he mentioned then a bit about how you can do it in principle for the like Hubbard model. Those papers did not go into to details of the, 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 the circuits yet. They simply mentioned that it can be done, but no details yet. The paper by the, 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 the Ortiz and Sommer, they showed the first time how you can do things, how you can evolve things under the Hubbard model. I'm, I'm, Hamiltonian, for example. But just the time evolution, the paper by Whitfield and the Aspuru, the, the, the Guzzi's group, that paper showed the explicit quantum circuits for the first time that you need to actually devolve a, like a wave function with the full electronic uh, the structure. The, 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 the Hamiltonian, this paper is written for people in chemistry, so it really explains what a quantum the, 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 the computer is, what a gate is, and so on. And, it, it, and it's nicely pedagogical. We wrote about six papers in the last years. You find them on the, 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 the archive by looking for papers with Troyer, Hastings, and Wecker as authors. Now, what we learned yesterday is first we learned about qubits and how with n qubits you can store the wave function to n spins or of n over two fermionic orbitals. Then we learned a bit about quantum algorithms and quantum gates. And what I wanted to show there was that in the, 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 the example of the, 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 the Deutsch algorithm, we saw that a quantum computer can do exponentially more than a classical one, but it's very hard to read out the answer. And it needs some smart thinking to find something that it can do well. We also learned about quantum gates. And the gates that we use is the Hadamard gate, we use the C rotation gate, we use the, the Y basis change gate, let me call it HY, and we use the C naught gate. And more we don't need to actually build the, the, the quantum circuit for quantum chemistry and material science and quantum physics. Then we talked about how do we prepare a state. We learned about the adiabatic state preparation. And to get the, get the, get the, 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 the eigenstate cleanly, we also learned about the quantum phase estimation.
And then I showed you circuits for the Hubbard model and circuits for an Ising model and a spin model. Other questions about these topics? What I want to talk about today is how do we actually solve, let's say, uh, electronic structure problem. You want to, for example, you want to find the room temperature superconductor. And you have an idea that a certain coup rate, if you push things around, might be one. So I want to calculate the properties of that. Or there's a very important application. You want to make fertilizer. Who knows how we make fertilizer? We use the Haber-Bosch process, for which you take, take nitrogen from the air, and you take methane, you, 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 you use high pressures, high temperature, you squeeze it together, and out comes ammonia. And you make fertilizer. That uses 5% of the world's, world's natural gas and 2% of the, the world's energy. Who knows how plants get fertilizer? They have microbes in the root system that just make it at room temperature ambient pressure. One knows the structure of the molecule that does it, but to solve it, you need to do the full CI with 200 orbitals. And there's no way you can do that on a classical computer. If you had a quantum computer, maybe we can do it, find out, and make cheaper fertilizer. That could be useful. Or you might want to just solve a frustrated spin model. So you can do all of that on a quantum computer. So how do we do it? Generally, we first start in some basis. And then I can do DFT on it, or to focus something that gives me an approximate grounded wave function. And that makes the basis set orthogonal. And then I write the Coulomb problem in that basis. And I get a model like this to solve. How do I solve it? I prepare a ground state and a phase estimate. If the Hartree-Fox state is not good enough, what do I do then? Then I start from the Hartree-Fox state and I adiabatically evolve from the Hartree-Fox state to the true ground state. And then, I get the ground state wave function and the ground state energy. After that, I still need to measure things that I want to measure, measure energies, measure forces, this measure properties, spectra, and so on. But I want to focus now on just how hard is it to actually just get the ground state. And uh, the way we do that, we learned yesterday. We start from some state like the Hartree-Fox state, and we evolve it under this Hamiltonian. It has lots and lots of terms, namely the to the four terms, but it's no problem. We just use a trotter breakup. Trotter breakup, and we evolve with each of these n to the four terms in every single time step. And for each of the terms, there are circuits. And we had them, the C naught strings and Hadamard and basis changes and rotations. It's just like what we did yesterday for the Hubbard model. This was the hopping term here. We had that. And this here is the Coulomb term, which just has more of these gates. And there's no problem. 
the complexity is polynomial as n to the four terms, and each circuit has the string of sinos that's at most n gates. So it can implement every term with the order n gates, and it can do one total time step with n to the five gates. And we did that. So then, with this, it seems it's really, really efficient. Because we can do a time step in the end to the five gate operations, and we just have to, to evolve for a certain time to find the ground state. And this, with this, we can do the, the, the quantum chemistry, material science, and do many, many things, and it's efficient. And so we then looked into the question is, what if we have a small quantum computer? If we have one with about 100 qubits or 200 qubits, then we can do full CI on 100 orbitals, and we cannot do that classically. So that could be very, very useful. And if we can go to 1,000 orbitals or 10,000, hey, then we are really amazingly good. But already with just 100 qubits or 200, we can do things that are classically impossible. So we asked the question then, can we do quantum chemistry? And can we solve an interesting problem in quantum chemistry if somebody gives me a small quantum computer with just about 200 qubits? So can we solve some classically intractable problem on a small quantum computer in my lifetime? We then change the question quickly because of problems I'll show you in a moment to can a classically intractable problem be solved on a huge quantum computer? And then we ask the question whether it can be solved on the largest imaginable quantum computer. Let me now discuss what are the problems. I mean, the problem is we can do it, but we have n to the four terms. Each term needs order n gates because then you have this Jordan Wigner string. Then the question is, how large can I choose the time step? When you look at the Trotter formula, then you find that the time step, that the, the t that I have, has to be chosen small enough that I have a bounded error. And let me call this number of terms m is the number of terms. And the time step has to go like O of 1 over m to the power of 3 half in a second of order trotter composition. That means it has to go like 1 over n to the 6. This means that the total number of gates I need to, to evolve a certain time t, I need to make t over delta t time steps. Meaning order n to the six time steps. Each Time step requires me to implement order n to the four terms. Each of these terms need order, needs order n gates. That means in total I have order of n to the six times n to the four times n order n to the eleven gates. N to the eleven is a polynomial time algorithm. Has anybody run it? an n to the 11 algorithm. Let's just make a quick estimate. Let's assume we can do one gate operation in one second. Let's not care about constants. But let's say we can do one gate operation in one nanosecond, extremely fast. Let's say I can do one nanosecond per gate. I want to choose something small but classically intractable. Let me choose n about a hundred. 
And this is about roughly 10 to the 22 gate operations times 10 to the minus 9 seconds. This would be about 10 to the 13 seconds, which is about 10 to the 6 years. So a rough estimate gives me a potential runtime of about a million years. Well, it's of the order of a million years. That's a unit. Now, it might be 100 years. It might be a billion years. It's rough. So we have a problem with that scaling. And that's when I say it's not enough to just prove that it's polynomial time complexity, but we also need to have the constants be small. Okay, I didn't care about them yet. I didn't really count the gates. Just look at the scaling, but we also need the power to come down a lot. And that's when he said that we have to have people think about how we would actually use a quantum computer. It's not enough to just prove a theorem that asymptotically it outperforms a classical computer. Because yes, asymptotically n to the 11 is better than 2 to the n. But it's still useless. An n to the 11 algorithm will never ever be useful. We need people to think about actually writing quantum codes. And that's why I'm teaching you this now because we need people who know about applications start thinking about it. So then we said, okay, we need people, kind of quantum programmers, quantum software engineers, applied quantum computing scientists, scientists, tests like you, to think about what one can do. And let me show what we've done and how it can be improved. What we said is we don't want to start doing start with the, the, the Cooper superconductor, which is just near thousands of uh, electron. But let's look at a small molecule and interesting thing, a chemical reaction. Let's look at something that needs about 100 to maybe 400 spin orbitals. What my chemistry colleagues want is they want the energy to about a micro heart rate possible, but at least 2.1 milli heart rate. Let us aim only for a milli heart rate. And the challenge here is that the total energies are roughly kilo heart rate, so I need to get the energies to at least six decimal digits. So this is the seventh and eighth digits where people fight about. It's those cases which are of the, 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 the are of the, the, the room temperature, and those cases matter. And then we took a simple. So for a real problem, a big one, one might need to, to run longer. If you want to go to a millihertz, well, then you need at least at least near ten times longer in time to a. To, micro heart at least a thousand times longer. And then we calculated it for a simple molecule with the needs near 118 qubits. And we found that just using published state of the other algorithms, it turns out that the total gate count comes, out, comes to about 10 to the 18. If I do things in parallel, what I can do in parallel, I still get to about 10 to the 17, and the estimated runtime is about 30 years. And that's when we say that is not feasible. This is not realistic. I don't want to work, wait 30 years to get the first Gaussian wave function prepared that I need to write my master's thesis. That's a no-go. If that's what it looks like, then it's a theoretical, beautiful idea to do quantum chemistry on a quantum computer, but it will never, ever be useful. What do you do when you're faced with that? Do you have a suggestion? You try to find a better algorithm, yes. Good idea. Any ideas? 
something better than quantum phase estimation for, for getting energy. So this is optimal as can be shown by Heisenberg's on, uh, on certainty principle. The time you need has to scale with one over the energy accuracy that you need. So, okay, but we can maybe do a better time evolution. So this scaling we can't get rid of. But maybe these scalings here can be improved. And so we don't want a better algorithm. As such, we want a better implementation. We want to optimize our code. Even classically, if you just write the code, it will be slow and you have to, 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 to optimize it. And we you know classically, we can easily get about a factor of 1,000 or 10,000 faster speed if we optimize our code. And so what can one do? One can try and optimize things. And let me just show you some ideas. And those were the, the next papers. We, in the end, got something like about a factor of 1,000 times n squared improvement. How do we get it? Let me show you one trick here. We have these order n gates per, per term, I mean, not per gate. We have the order n gates per term, and that comes from these long strings of C knots that we have for the Jordan Wigner terms. So we have these long C knot strings that takes, takes roughly n on average terms. But now, if you say, I want to hop, for example, from here to here, a term in one step, and then the next term is something where I go, for example, from here to here. Then most of the calculation here was to calculate the parity of uh, electrons between two sides. If I've calculated the parity down to here, if I then go once, one side further, I don't have to uncompute it and recompute it. I can reuse the term I had and just add one extra term to it. So these long strings can be reused and collapsed. I, let me make space here. So if I have to hop, for example, from this side here to this side in one term, and then the next one I go from this to this, then I have calculated already this parity here. I don't have to redo it. I just take this plus, <coughs> plus this side. That takes these long chains of strings and makes them easy if I sort the terms in the right way. That gives me a factor n. This becomes about constant per term. The next idea is, what if I have multiple terms? Can I do multiple terms at once, in parallel? And that can be done easily in a spin model. For the spin model, we did it. We had our sites, and we said, I want to apply the transfer field. I can just apply the transverse field rotation, Rx term, on every qubit at once because those terms commute. You can just do them in parallel, and you can do n terms in parallel. Can I do that for hopping terms? The answer is not really because of those Jordan Wigner strings. They touch all the qubits in between. I can't do this hopping term and that hopping term in parallel because they overlap. But if you think a bit more cleverly about it, let me draw them, them like this, my sides here. If I do one hopping term that goes between these two sides, That's easy. Then I can do hopping term between these two sides at the same time. Why? Because, yes, this happens 
as well, but this hopping term here does not change the parity of electrons. It might move one from here to here, but it doesn't change the parity between the two sides. And this one here as well can be done at the same time because these terms here do not change the parity and all I need to implement this term here is the parity of the number of electrons here. Is it odd or even? The same with this term and the same with these. So though it seems at first that I can't do it because cos cost me uh, the the touch the same qubits, you first calculate the parity of these two sides and the parity of these four and these six and these eight. Then after that, I can do all these terms at once. That means I can do again another factor of n for making things parallel. So that means that actually I go here not just, I don't have n gates, but I can do n terms in O1. Okay, so with the constant number or with log n to get this pair is calculated with log n gates per n terms when I'm smart. Okay, so we gain the fact of n squared. So things become much easier now. Instead of n to the 11, I'm down to n to the 9. Is this then we can do another thing. You can improve the phase estimation. I showed you the phase estimation. It's I have an ancilla. And when it's zero, I don't do it to anything. When the ancilla is one, I evolve with the Hamiltonian. Right? And then I measure the phase. Here's a better version that naively seems two times better. That is actually four times better. What I do now is simply, if the ancilla is zero, I go backwards in time. When it's one, I go forward. It takes the same circuit. It just wants to go backward and wants to go forward. Now, this gives me twice the phase, so I need to run only half the time. So it saves a factor of two. Where does the, the other factor of two come from? That comes from the cost of doing a controlled rotation. What we didn't talk about yet is or what I mentioned, but which I didn't go into details yet, is let's say we do some term, and it's just the evolution under a term minus h times sigma ic, a simple longitude in the field term. Or we can do also more terms then. And this basically just becomes a rotation. The rotation by some angle, theta. For uh, some time step. But now remember the phase estimation. With the phase estimation algorithm, we had an ancilla that we set to zero. We did the Hadamard gate. So that we get 0 plus 1 times 1 over 2. And then controlled on this, I wanted to apply my unitary evolution to my wave function psi. That means I should rotate only if this ancilla is 1 and not if it's 0. That means that here now I have to do in this case a controlled rotation. Should control, I should rotate only if this is set to 1. But we don't have a controlled rotation gate, do we? We never talked about one. So how do I actually do the controlled rotation? Who can see it? 
all I give you are rotations and other mass and controlled knots. So I want to do something now that if this is zero, does nothing, and if it's one, does a rotation. So here's the trick. I first do just the rotation. And do a rotation by some angle. Let me call, okay, let me do a rotation by an angle, by half the angle, theta over 2. Now what I want to do is, if the ancilla is 0, I want to rotate back, backwards. To undo it, if it's 1, I want to rotate forward. What I can do now is I can do a control knot operation here. And if this is 1, then I'm now flipping the spin. When I'm flipping it, that means, that, and if I now do a rotation by minus half the angle, then I want to change the basis again by undoing the control knot. What happens now, if this control is zero, then I'm rotating by half the angle, and I'm rotating backwards by half the angle, and I've done nothing. If this is one, I'm rotating by half the angle, I'm flipping the sign of the variable of the spin, and I'm rotating thus again by half the angle, and in total I've rotated by the angle. So when the DSL is zero, I don't do t t t anything. When it's one, I'm rotating by the angle. But it means that to do a the controlled rotation, we need to do basically two rotations by half the angle. And rotations are expensive because I have to, to express them through the T gates and other gates, and it's about 50 gates or so in the end. Now, when I do this type of phase estimation, then I just want to go forward or backwards depending on the ancilla. So it's not a control, but just the sign is dependent on the ancilla. For this rotation, when I just want to change the sign if the ancilla is 1, then all I need to do is, I need to do a C naught based on the ancilla, the rotation, and the C naught again. And do only a single rotation. So say if a factor 2, because I need to, to go to only 2 half the time. I say another factor 2, because I can do a simple rotation gate instead of the control rotation, and thus I need only half the number of the expensive rotation gates. So that's another factor of four that I have. And finally, it turns out that the trotter error is fortunately not as bad as the worst case bound is. If you, and the reason why it can be improved is again tricks. We have lots and lots of terms here. Let's look at the Hamiltonian again. We have n to the four terms, but most matrix uh, elements will be small, very small. Some will be large, many, many, many will be small. And the trick that saves us there is that the small terms, I don't have to do it every time step. What I do is for a tiny term, for example, I do it only every tenth time step, but then with 10 times the time step. So I use large time step for the small matrix elements and use small time steps for the large ones. A tiny term I can just do, do less often, but then I do it all at once with a bigger angle. And that way I can gain another at least factor of 10 and scaling improves. So if we then estimate what comes out at the end for this molecule that we looked at is with all of these improvements, When you're smart, 
Okay, then we can also make the circuits a bit better. That gives us another factor of 10. And so we get the, the, the factor of n. Doing your things in parallel, a factor n by simplifying the Jotun and Gewigner strings, a factor 4 by making the circuits faster than what I showed, a factor 4 with a better phase estimation, a factor 10 by doing the small terms with the larger time step, and another factor of 10 by smartly sorting the terms. I have many terms here, and if I sort them in the right way, I can make the total error even smaller. So being smart here gives me another a factor 10, and in total then we have about a factor of 1,000 n squared. And the runtime of what looked like 30 years comes down to about two minutes. And two minutes, that sounds totally reasonable. Now, it still needs a fast machine where we have a gate time of nanoseconds. It has to be stable for minutes. And this is a challenge to build. But at least now it no longer seems like science fiction. But it seems like this could actually be done. So, and I think we can save, save more time here by, by writing even smarter codes. So this is doable for a small molecule. Now I want to discuss two more things. The first is I want to first scale up. Now I don't want to do just a molecule. Now I want to do a room temperature superconductor that I want to design. And before I do that, I want to kind of check whether I understand the cuprates. And there we have about 50 bands per unit cell. And I want to look at pair correlation functions over at least a distance of maybe 20 times 20. So I need about 20 times 20 unit cells, which then gives us about 80,000 spin orbitals. The number of terms is n to the 4. And even if we get this scaling down from this to optimistically n to the about 5.5 or n to the 5, if when you plug in 80,000 into that, then you see the time is now a few billion years, and it's about the age of the universe. And it's not much. People would only do thousands of uh, electrons in DFT. DFT is not exact, as we know. On a quantum computer, we can do it efficiently in polynomial time. But because of the scaling we have, <clears throat> when you plug in the numbers, it again looks like science fiction. What do we do now? Better algorithms, yes. But I've already optimized things nearly as much as I can. Okay, you want to do, do something that's maybe better than Trotter. Okay, but you can't get it down to below n to the 4. Because that many terms I just have in the Coulomb Hamiltonian. I can't really get it much better than that. Because at least I have to feed in the terms that I have. Any idea? Hmm? Hubbard model. Yes, we can go to effective models. Let's, for example, go to the Hubbard model. See, I magically, quantum mechanically moved your idea to a slide now. <laughs> what does it look like for a Hubbard model? In a Hubbard model, I need just about one band per unit cell. I take the same number of unit cells. It's about 800. The number of interaction terms is only n, because I have two hoppings and one u term per site. I can do the same nesting tricks to basically do all terms in parallel meaning a time step only takes about log n time. Well, it's not O1, but it's order log n. 
And so the time to do the phase estimation scales with the logarithm of the number of sites. So it's milliseconds. Okay, I might have to find the ground state, so I have two diabetically evolve it. I make a guess for what is the ground state, maybe in a D with your t t t t t superconductor. I start from a mean field state. I evolve to the full Hamiltonian with the, with an adiabatic state preparation. The gap closes at the end. The gap closes with one over the linear size. So the so the scaling of the total time with preparation is linear in the number of sites that I have. So instead of milliseconds, it might take a second. But basically, in a second. I can prepare the ground state of the tilt Hubbard model and have the wavefront of the on it 20 times 20 lattice. I say, okay, that's not big enough. I need 100 times 100. Okay, that might take half a minute. Then half a minute I can have then the ground state wave function of the Hubbard model prepared easily. Now, what will the Hubbard model tell us about the material? You've heard talks by people talking about Hubbard models or quantum spin models. You have heard talks by people talking about DFT and materials. But there's a bit of a disconnect between the two groups, groups most of the time. One look at models to understand the mechanisms. And for that, the Hubbard model is great. The other group looks at the real material and wants to have quantitative numbers for a material. And if you talk to a material scientist, and I did that, I asked one about whether she would be excited if using quantum gases, for example, optical lattices, we could build her a machine that can solve the Hubbard model and solve it. And she answered, no, she wouldn't even look at the paper. Why not? Because the Hubbard model is not relevant for any material. It's too simple a, a, a toy model. Okay, I challenged her then, okay, why don't you design a material that's modeled by the Hubbard model? And she did now, but she's still not so convinced that the Hubbard model is interesting. So yes, we can easily do lots and lots of interesting quantum lattice models that will be great for those people working on quantum lattice models. But you've heard yesterday about functionals. PBE, that paper has been cited 60,000 times. The HITC paper has been cited a few thousand times. So the field of the material science is by the fact of 10 to 100 bigger than lattice models. So can we use a quantum computer then also to simulate such a uh, correlated material? Any suggestion? What methods have you heard about? You've heard about DMFT, right? That can be combined with DFT. You can get an effective model extracted from DFT calculations. That is more realistic than the Hubbard model. And then you, you, you can solve that. How large a problem can you solve with DMFT? About five orbitals. That's tiny. You can't really do it for a complex material. But now just think about what you learned about DMFT. And you have these quantum Monte Carlo methods to solve it for a tiny purity problem. How about if we, re if we replace that QMC solver by a quantum computer? Let's do DFT plus, plus DMFT. And then use a quantum computer to solve that problem on a big impurity system. We can do many bands in DMFT. 
suddenly interesting, and we can do much better. So what that means is for these materials, everything thing you learned so far will remain important even if I give you a quantum computer. Because the codes, codes we use in the end will not be, I just run it brute force on a quantum computer and I wait for the age of the universe. That is not the way to go. That will never work. Simply because the number of terms is too large. You can't do it exactly. So we need some hybrid methods where I do most things classically. Where I do, do most of the band structure classically and then I define an effective impurity model or effective lattice model for the important correlated bands. And this effective model, I can then solve more accurately on a quantum computer. But it will have to be, be such a hybrid method of classical plus quantum. So it, should, so it will, in the end, be a subroutine in your big package, for example, in VAS brothers. They will then call a quantum algorithm somewhere, and uh, the way that most people will maybe in 30 years use it is they just pick another solver somewhere or some flag somewhere, quantum equal two or something. But we need you, potentially, to actually write this package for them or this plugin. So that's how we would actually use it. Not brute force that the quantum computer will change everything, because the scaling can be too bad. We will also not have a quantum cell phone, probably, because most things which you do in your near cell phone, you can do well enough now. You don't need a qubit in here. So then the next thing you want to do is what do we do once we have the wave function prepared? Because that's all we talked about now. They take minutes or seconds or hours or a long, long time to get the ground state wave function. What do you do once you have the ground state wave function and the energy? Is that what interests you? Or if I give you here, so who's that Hubbard model? You. If I give you here a quantum register that contains the ground state wave function of the Hubbard model, which in my first machine, it took me a year to prepare it, and here it is. What do you do with it? Huh? You want to dope it. Oh, so, so, no, so here's a new wave function after another year. Here's the dope tablet model. Here's the, the ground state wave function. What do you do with it? Yeah. So how, how do we find out what, what phases we have? And how do we find that out? You have the wave function here. Tell me how you would get it. You measure something, right? For example, let's start, we just want to measure the density. Okay, then I measure one of the qubits, and I get, for example, one, or I get zero, right? Because you can only get one or zero. So then you, and then you get one. And so you get one, one, zero, one. So you know when you measured it, the, the hole was here and here, for example. And the wave function has collapsed, it's gone. I can measure a density correlation, measure the density here and density there, and have a density correlation. But I get only one shot, I get either zero or one, right? So I basically do Monte Carlo sampling because you have the wave function, and the wave function tells you the probability of measuring either zero or one. And, and the big advantage you have when you run it on a classical computer is Yes, you need exponential memory, but then you have the wave function. You can really calculate all expectation values precisely because you have the wave function stored. On a quantum computer, I give it to you in this very compact with only n qubits instead of 2 to the n classical numbers. It's much, much shorter, but you can't read out all the entries of the wave function. You can sample it. 
that if you want to get all of the values, it takes exponentially many samples because there are exponentially many measurements you have to do. So yes, you can sample it. Like Monte Carlo, you sometimes get zero, sometimes get one. So you don't need it just one. So let me give you now a million of these wave functions. And with a million of these wave functions, you can do the measurement to 10 to the minus 3 precision because you basically do sampling, statistical sampling. So we don't have to pre prepare just once in seconds. But after we did it, we do a measurement, and we get only a single bit out, 0 or 1, per qubit that we have. And the sampling error just goes down with 1 over the square root of the time. So if I want something to three digits, I have to run it, I have to prepare it a million times. So we don't need just to but I want it to be fast, so I might just get a cluster of a thousand quantum computers. But it's, it gets expensive, and so what one should think about now is we should think about ways of how we can actually do it better. Can we get a better algorithm? Can we do the sampling so that it doesn't take one over this? The accuracy squared, but it takes one over the accuracy. Time. And, okay, see, it might be easy to make the ground state, but it might also be very, very hard because there's a tiny gap and they have to run the diabetic state preparation very, very, very slowly. And it might have taken me a year to make that ground state wave function that I gave you. So I don't want you to destroy it, because when you destroy it, then you have to wait another year for the second one. Or we build a million quantum computers. So do you know a way of measuring without destroying the wave function that I gave you? I want you to measure. But don't touch the wave function. Can we do that? Let's make a vote. Who thinks we can? Who thinks we can't? What if I measure something, then I measure again? I get the same. Because once I've collapsed into an eigenstate, I always get the eigenvalue. So we can if we only measure the eigenvalue when it's an eigenstate. When it's an eigenstate of the measurement operator, then I can measure without destroying it. For example, once I have prepared the ground state, I can measure the ground state energy without destroying the state. I stay in it. So can we do measurements just by measuring ground state energies? Have you heard about the Hellman Feynman theorem? Which is when, what is it? Can you tell me? Shall I tell it? It's when you perturb a Hamiltonian, then the change in ground state energy is the expectation value of the perturbation in the original ground state. So I have the Hamiltonian H, and I have its ground state. Let me call it Gs. Or and now let me look at H plus some small epsilon times some perturbation O. And from this, OK, this and the ground state energy, let me call it EGS. From this here, I can evolve to the ground state as a function of epsilon, but by sl slowly like, switching on the perturbation. And then I can also get the ground state energy as a function of epsilon. 
And what we know is that the ground state energy of epsilon minus the ground state energy at zero is just epsilon times the expectation value of O in the, in the original ground state. Plus terms of order epsilon squared. So to measure the expectation value in the ground state, I just have to measure how does the ground state energy change when I slightly perturb the, the Hamiltonian with the operator that I want to measure. So I start in H, I slowly evolve it, it is to a Theoretically, go to the, the, the ground state of H plus uh, plus negative epsilon times the operator. I mean the ground state. Then I do a negative phase estimation to measure the energy. The energy difference tells me the expectation value that I wanted, and then I take the ground state back it, it, it theoretically to the original state. That we have measured an expectation value without destroying the ground state. Then there's another way of doing measurements. What I can do is I can take, take my wave function and then measure something. Let, let's say this is the ground state and then measure some qubit. And now I get either 0 or 1. And I'm now in some eigenstate of that measurement. I have taken that state and I have perhaps projected it onto a negative eigenstate of the quantity. So I've destroyed my ground state but they've changed only a single qubit. And there's a trick now due to Hastings that we published in June. What one can do now is, so I have only weakly perturbed my ground state. And now I do another measurement and then measure a single qubit again, and measure if I am in the ground state. I do just a single qubit measurement whether I'm in the ground state or not. How can I do that? I can, for example, do a phase estimation, but I don't measure it. I just check whether the bits I get are the ground state energy, and I measure that single bit that tells me that the phase estimation is either the ground state or not. If that measurement of the test, whether I'm in the ground state, says yes, then I'm, then I'm one. If this is yes, then I'm back in the ground state. Because I just did a test whether I'm in the ground state or not, it tells me I'm in the ground state at one. If I'm not in the ground state, boom, what should I do? I don't have, yeah? I'm now in some state. I don't know what state it is. I'm not in the ground state. That means now I'm in an excited state, or I'm in a superposition of excited states. What I can do 
if no, I just measure that one quantity again. I measure that qubit again. And now I'm back to the ground state projected into one of the eigenstates of the measurement, and I try again. I try that a few, a few times, and at some point I come out, because I have only four possible states. I can be the ground state or not, the measurement can be zero, one. So that's a four-dimensional subspace of the big Hilbert space, and that space I make a random walk by measurements. It can be zero or one the state, and can be ground state or the other state. Can I do that a few ten times, a hundred times? And most of the time, after a few ten times, I'll be back out and I have the ground state fixed. Now, it could be by chance that the state I get here is orthogonal to the ground state. Then I'm never in the ground state. That's a tiny, tiny set of measure zero. But if I hit that by chance, then I see after a thousand times, I don't find it, then I have to give up and start again and make it new. But it's rare. Most of the time, I do it and measure, and then after I measure, I just check, am I in the ground still or not? If I am, I'm done. If yes, I fix it. When I did a single qubit measurement, I do a weak perturbation, and I can fix it again. Another trick you can do to speed it up further is we learned how to do phase estimation. And phase estimation gives you a quantity to error epsilon in time that goes like 1 over epsilon. On the Carlos sampling, the time goes like, like negative 1 over epsilon squared. So we can put this into a phase estimation algorithm. And we don't measure here but we get a phase depending on the outcome of the measurement. And when instead of measuring, you advance the oscilla by a certain phase, then you do the, the phase estimation, then you get speed up in the measurements. So there are lots of tricks how one can do measurements, fast and more efficient. And those tricks are mentioned in the papers I mentioned. So let me stop here with that part and ask if there are questions. Yeah. Maybe I don't understand it correctly, but you measure only one qubit at a time? I measure only one qubit. When I measure all qubits, then it's just totally destroyed. The initial state is initial ground state is the tangent. Yeah. So the collapse is only one part of the state of the and I have n qubits, I measure one qubit. It's entangled. It collapses into uh, the eigenstate, uh, the eigen space of that measurement. So, the is unchanged. This qubit becomes zero or one. If it's zero, then it take out the wave function where this is zero. If it's one, then it's that that one and and the the rest is the, the state it was in when that qubit was one. So, so let's say the state that we measured here was that one qubit we had, which could be zero or one, and we can write it in the, 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 the Schmidt decomposition as some let let's call it alpha times zero times some psi zero on the rest, plus beta times one and the psi one on the rest. And that's how how I can write the ground state here. If I measure zero, then that is zero, and that's the rest of the system. If I measure one, then that's one, and that's the rest of the system. And now I measure whether I'm in the ground state. When I measure this, then I can either go back to this state or I go to some other state. Okay, I can do a quantum phase estimation, for example. Let's say I do the quantum phase estimation, then measure the energy, and I read out all 
the ancilla qubits, then if a readout accounts state energy, then yes, I mean the count state. Good, F1. But if I don't read out the ground state energy, then I have a problem because now I've gone into some excited state. And which one depends on those qubits that I've collapsed? So I've collapsed into some excited state, and it can be any of the two to the n excited states. And I've lost. So what I would do is I would do the phase estimation. I have my energy register here, and I have my wave function psi here. I do the controlled, okay, these multiple controls, fancy one, I do the quantum Fourier transform. And then here now, I have the binary representation of my ground state, of the energy. Right, so these are now the bits of the, of the energy, of the state. But still in a quantum superposition. I have not collapsed anything. It's still the same wave function. If I measure, then I collapse. But now I don't measure. But now what I do is I'm, I do a single measurement, namely a check. Is this first bit the first bit of the ground state energy? And is the second bit the second bit of the ground state energy? And is the third bit the third bit and the fourth bit the fourth bit? And the only measurement I do is whether all these bits agree with the ground state energy or not. That way I measure only a single qubit, and now I've either collapsed into the ground state, or I've collapsed into a single well-defined other state. There's only two states, the ground state or the coherent superposition of the other states. So it's just a two-dimensional subspace, because I measure just a single qubit. If it's the ground state, I've won. If it's not the ground state, then I repeat the measurement of that quantity, and I go back into either this or that. Mm. Then I try again. Some people like Hastings are really smart. So yeah, but so I'm not allowed to measure those bits because then if I'm not in the ground state, I'm lost. I'm somewhere. So just check whether the, all these bits agree. I, do a, I compare and check whether they're all the same. If they are, then... So in, so in this is uh, a circuit I write, and then there's a single bit which I measure. Like in the Deutsch algorithm, I wanted to know whether the function was constant or not, and that single bit I measured. And then I'm safe and I can do that. That way, you've measured without destroying the state. And that can help you a lot because the, 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 the phase estimation might take seconds, making the, the state might take hours, and you've saved a, a lot of time. What if you want to do dynamical measurements? The dynamical relation functions. I take it, I apply the operator, I evolve it in time, I apply to the next operator and the measure. What if you want to do a spin correlation function? The qubits have to measure for the spin up or down. What if you want to do a pair correlation function? Just take a pairing term here in the measurement and they do it. More questions? If not, then to end the first part of the lecture, I want to discuss with you 
why besides solving the Hubbard model and spin model and maybe some materials, we want to build a quantum computer? And let me just get a slide for that. See, because I mentioned that we need to know if you, so, okay, first of all, do you want to have a quantum computer after what I told you now? Do you want one? Who wants one? Yeah. Now, I told you yesterday it will cost a lot of money. It will cost several billions. Okay, it will be great to build it and it will take another 15, 20 years and we want to do that, but somebody must give us the money. And if it, in the end, to really scale it up, if it costs tens of billions, we need to convince companies to actually give us the money. And that's a non-trivial sum of money. 50 million, 100 million, that's easy research funding, basic research, that's not hard. Okay, it takes time, but that's not hard to get. A billion or 10 billion is much harder. And then they ask the question, so what can you do with it? So what are the important applications that the problem that you can solve in a quantum computer? That's one thing. Curing cancer might not count you. They ask, how do you cure cancer with a quantum computer? So you have to come up with an idea. Let's say you have an idea how you can do that. It's something that you can do on a quantum computer in a time scale that's less than 30 years or a million years, but also that you cannot do on the best special purpose classical hardware that you can build with the same 10 billion in the next 10 years. You have to be better than anything I can build classically in that application for that problem. Because if you can build it in 10 years with 10 billion in a special purpose big classical supercomputer, then that's cheaper. So that's the question that are being asked by Microsoft, IBM, Nokia, Intel, and others since a few years now. Because since they realized companies are getting involved, and the, the others also want to join, uh, but okay, why are we investing that much money? Yes, we have to invest the money because the others are doing it, but actually, why are we all doing it? And so, I showed you one application. We can use it to solve quantum models, materials, to find new materials, to maybe think about can we do a, do a room temperature t superconductor to maybe understand how to make a negative catalyst for making a fertilizer and so on. So we can find great applications that are worth billions in negative material science or chemistry. But those companies ask, is that all they state? So we just sell it to one pharma company and that's it? But they want to have a bit more applications. And when you talk to people in quantum computing, then they first tell you, yes, there's Grover Search. Who has heard about Grover Search? So Grover Search is a very interesting thing, something where you can prove that a quantum computer is faster than any classical computer can ever be. What you get is you get a database, but they don't give you access to the database. They just give you a black box that you can ask, what is the number stored at entry number 735? And it tells you Trieste. And you ask, what is stored at number 289? And it tells you Roma, other things. So you can just access it with an index, and it gives you what's stored there. And now you have to find where is Venezia? And the only thing you can do classically, you have to really go through it until you find it. Because it's not sorted or anything. But on, the, on quantum hardware, you can cure it with a superposition of all indices. And then Grover showed that it can be done in, with square root of n curies to this black box oracle. But classically, you have to use at least order n. So it's provable quantum speed up. 
And it's beautiful. However, they just assume that this black box exists and that the call is free. And you just count how many calls you do to it. But somewhere there's a database stored in there. In order to answer the query, I have to load the database in and I have to go through it. I have to load the database. And if you come with a superposition of all entries in the quantum case, then I have to load all entries and give you back a wave function with all the entries. And I cannot implement that faster than with the number of cities that I need to read from the database. Just can't be done faster because I need to access them all. And instead of doing this black box, Oracle, that loads this wave function from the database, I can just give you another one that while loading it just checks where's Venezia and gives you the answer back. So implementing a single call takes order n when there are n entries stored, if it's stored in a database, because I have to load them all. So actually, I'm not doing, doing root n times, but I'm doing root n times the cost n of implementing the oracle. So it goes like n to the 3 half, which is worse than classical, where while reading, I can just check where it is. And if you want to look it up multiple times in a classically, I can sort it and it goes down to log n. So go search for looking up things in a database is useless. The experts know that. It's just how it's presented. It's just how the textbooks do it. But if you think about implementing it, it's useless. Not totally. It's useful if this database can be calculated on the fly. So it's useful if this is not a database, but a function of which you want to know at which value is a function that you can easily compute. Is it, for example, 5 or 7? For finding the, 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 the roots of functions is very useful. But now we have to think of applications where finding the root of a function is useful. There are cases... There are math problems where it's useful. I haven't found a real application yet to a real world problem. I say, okay, yes, that's where it's at least worth to pay a million to buy such a quantum computer. We haven't found that yet. So that's one, one homework for you. Find a problem where this really solves an important real world problem where somebody would pay money to solve it. Next is factoring. It's hard. I give you this number. I promise you, you will not be able to factor it. I can. Here are the factors. How could I do it? Is it because I had a quantum computer? I just didn't tell you about it. It is the opposite. I took two prime numbers and multiplied them. One is easy, the other way is hard, unless you have a quantum computer. With a quantum computer, this can be done in n cube time if you have 2n plus 3 qubits. With about 3n qubits, you need n squared time. With n squared qubits, you need linear time. It goes fast. And that way, you can crack encryption. But it's useful, and you can crack, uh, crack encryption in a short time. But the moment we have one, we just change to quantum cryptography or two lattice here based schemes that are not vulnerable to quantum attacks, and it's not an application anymore. The new things we send will be safe, and in 10 years, Whoever was interested in reading our encrypted emails loses interest because they're too old and nobody will buy a quantum computer anymore. Now let me show you another pitfall. There's a very beautiful paper by Lidar's group who looked at quantum page rank. Page rank on a quantum computer. Finding the, the best hit when you search for a web page. And what's nice in this paper is that that's one of the few papers that really works out the complete cost for implementing every single detail. I'm not just saying the scaling, if I have a black box oracle, is asymptotically polynomial. But it really worked out the numbers and all, and really showed how things can be implemented. 
And while theoretically log n qubits are enough, he showed that it's very hard to implement, but one can easily do it if you use n qubits. And then you just have to implement this Hamiltonian, and you have to the time evolve it and do a negative phase estimation. And this can be done in an analog machine that you built, and something thing like D-Wave, for example. If you have all those couplings, but you need n squared couplings in here that you built, and then. He finds that with n squared hardware resources, he can solve the page rank problem in a time that scales with n to about 0 0.2. In the best case, maybe goes up to, to n, but it's always better than n. And it goes, goes like n squared. Yeah, sorry, like n to the power of 0 0.2. Well, classically, to the page rank, I need to multiply like a matrix test. With vectors, and maybe 10 times 100 times, and the complexity of each one is the number of non zeros in the matrix. And that's the case with some constant, which is the, 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 the mean number of links per web page times the number of web pages. But it's at least linear, so he says, look, there's a quantum speed up from constant times n, they go to n to the power of 0 0.2, potentially. Do you agree, or do you see a problem here? And he thought of it. He said, OK, th this is the best classic algorithm he found published anywhere. This is how it scales. And he can beat it. What he did not think about is that you could invent a new and better classical algorithm that also runs parallel. Because yes, it's true, this is the complexity, and memory is about n qubits versus n bits. It's the same scaling. But then, let's now assume I give you not only n squared quantum gates, but I also give you all the n squared classical gates. Then you can build a special purpose classical computer with an all to all network, with n squared network links. And when I do that, then the time complexity for doing a matrix vector multiplication goes down to log n. On hardware that exists, it's n to the one third, because people typically build their 3D network with your nearest neighbor links. But if I assume n squared hardware and all to all links for the quantum hardware, then you should also allow me all to all links for the classical hardware I'm building. Even that, then the time goes down to log n with actually only d times n hardware instead of n squared hardware if I specialize it for a certain matrix. And the classical parallel version performs faster than the quantum algorithm. So that shows that you should not compare a parallel special purpose quantum computer against a general purpose single CPU of a classical computer, but you should scale the hardware in the same way and say, what if I build the same way a special purpose device, and then boom, sometimes quantum speed vanishes. There are more applications. There's a great paper by Tarrow and co-workers who show that you can solve a linear system in logarithmic time on a quantum computer. And the only thing you need, OK, you have it fit in a qubit, so you can read out only log n bits. But it might be just that you want to know whether a certain property is larger than a value or not. So when you don't want the full vector, but just some property of it, then it works. It has to be well conditioned. And you have to be able to evolve the vector with the matrix. And the basic idea is you evolve with A. When you do this, we can do quantum phase estimation. The quantum phase estimation basically calculates all of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. 
then it can divide by the eigen value, and then it can transform back. So I go to the eigen basis, I divide by the eigen value, and I transform back. And that way you've multiplied this with the inverse of A. And you've solved a linear system with only log n qubits. But you need to evolve with the matrix A. And for a general matrix, if you just give me a matrix stored in memory that has n squared entries, and I need to read in these n squared entries, so I cannot do the time evolution faster than an n squared time, because at least I have to feed in these numbers. And in n squared time, I can solve it classically. There is a way, there's a proposal by Lloyd's group that you can do something like a QRAM, a quantum RAM, where you just read it from that. But that QRAM needs n squared hardware. And with n squared hardware, I can solve the problem also classically in logarithmic time. Even worse, if you give me n squared hardware for log n qubits, with n squared hardware, I can build a quantum simulator for two log n qubits, and I can build you an, a simulator for a quantum computer with the same hardware resources, if you don't need more than two log n qubits. So then I can just run it on the simulator with the same scaling. So that tells you, if you have to read the matrix from somewhere, then you're lost. Once you have to read the matrix, a linear system can be solved efficiently classically. This is not a hard classical problem. It's one problem that we know how to solve. So it's not surprising that you can't speed it up because we can solve it in the time it needs to basically read in the matrix. So then there's nothing to improve because we have to anyway read in the matrix. But it can be realized if you don't have to read the matrix, but if you can calculate it. If you know the matrix and there's some closed form equation, like you have some mesh and you want to do some wave scattering of uh, electro magnetic waves, and you want to do that on an extremely fine mesh. In this case, we can calculate the matrix, and that way it can be faster. And then it is exponentially faster than a classical algorithm. And there was a nice paper in PL that showed how it can be done. And they also really calculated most of what it takes to do the calculation and counted the number of gates. And they found that, yes, asymptotically, this is really better than a classical supercomputer. And it wins once the, the, the mesh is so fine, the problem size is so large, that you need about a, a millennium to solve the problem. So if the calculation takes more than a 1,000 years, then use a quantum computer and it will be faster. What does that tell you? Linear problems are hard, but we, it tells you don't give up, improve the algorithm. Think about it, can we do it faster? But one should not look at the easy problems, but we have to, to look at hard classical problems, but hard classical problems for which there are quantum algorithms. That brings me back to what we did before. If you look at the first codes in the world that reached a petaflop, the first five codes that run, ran at more than a petaflop were all doing material science, chemistry, material science, or nanoscience. science. They all solved the Schrodinger equation. So these are hard problems which really need the biggest machines. And these are problems for which for Feynman, already we know that a quantum computer can solve them. So, 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 so solving quantum problems really seems to be the killer application for a quantum computer. And that's why that's what we have to work on, because that's where a quantum computer really shines, because it uses quantum mechanics. And if you have something that uses quantum mechanics, then it can clearly be used to solve quantum problems, and that's the native application. The rest might be hard. So what I, I showed you now that will really be 
the main application once we have a quantum computer. And that's what we have to argue about uh, and make it happen in the next 10 or 20 years. In the next lecture part, we go to the, 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 the computer room. We we'll give you, you a simple Python file that implements your quantum gates, and then you can actually simulate a quantum computer. Apply a Hadamard gate, apply a rotation, do a quantum phase estimation, and try and run a quantum algorithm. That's after the coffee break. <laughs>